Welcome to the latest session in the Learning, Equity, and Power, or LEAP series presented by the Center for the Study of Social Policy. My name is Anand Sharma, and I'm a senior associate at CSSP, and I'll be your host for the session. Before we jump into conversation with our guests, I wanted to share a bit about CSSP and the LEAP initiative. CSSP works to achieve a racially, economically, and socially just society in which all children and families thrive. To do this, we promote public policies grounded in equity, support strong and inclusive communities, and advocate with and for all children and families marginalized by public policies and institutional practices. We seek to transform ideas into action, and LEAP is a new initiative to help us do just that. During this session and throughout the series, we will be highlighting and encouraging learning about what it takes to advance equity and build power in communities. We hope that you'll join us, contribute your expertise and experience, and think about how these lessons might help you to more powerfully advance equity in the communities that you care about. Given CSCP's longstanding commitment to supporting community policy and systems change, we couldn't be more thrilled to continue our LEAP series with this session, a foundation's path to power building and health equity, lessons from the California Endowment's Building Healthy Communities Initiative. CSSP has had the pleasure and the privilege of being one of TC's learning partners over the past few years. And we're excited to share some of the insights we and other learning and evaluation partners have discovered alongside TCE and its many, many partners across California. In this session, we'll hear about TC's path to supporting community power building, how we can use an ecosystem approach to better understand and support power building, and some of the implications for philanthropic strategy and practice that is aimed at advancing racial and health equity. We are very fortunate to be joined by three amazing guests who can help offer just a introduction, the slightest introduction to the large collection of research and learning drawing on TCE's past decade of work through building healthy communities. Uh, I'll be introducing them one at a time and then we'll have a bit of conversation with uh, all three. And with that, I'd like to introduce our first guest, Lauren Padilla Valverde, who serves as TCE's director racial equity, practice, and culture. Lauren, welcome to the Leap Lab. How are you this morning? Good morning from the West Coast. Buenos dias. How's everybody? It's nice to see all the, all the beautiful faces. Good morning. We are so happy to have you, Lauren. I'm going to get right into it because there's so much that we want to talk with you about. But before we talk about uh, BHC, before we talk about TC, I just wanted to start with a, a more personal question. And I'd love for you to share with folks the path that you took, uh, your kind of unique entry into the world of, of philanthropy. Thanks, Anand. And uh, thank you again, um, and good morning. Yes, I'm. Uh, my name is Lauren Padilla Valverde. Um, I am the daughter of Guatemalan immigrants who came to the United States in the late 60s, fleeing um, violence and a lot of um, political upheaval that was actually as a direct response to the US uh, forces there in that country. And, you know, when you ask me how I came into philanthropy, you know, I always go back to sort of the, the, the origins of my lineage, which includes my dad and his influence. He was an organizer in Guatemala. And the through line of my, um, my upbringing, my educational experience, and ultimately my, my medical career before philanthropy was really in um, understanding, you know, that change doesn't happen only at the top. Change has to happen um, at the roots. <laughs> and um, my work in medicine uh, was mostly focused on, you know, in medicine, we focus on uh, the symptoms to address, but we don't really, we don't tend to, in Western medicine, we don't tend to focus on root causes. And about 12 years ago, I had an opportunity to come into philanthropy. And what, what piqued my interest about the opportunity was that the opportunity was in the community I grew up in, in the Salinas Valley, which is the central coast of California, which is where my parents came to work in the first vineyards. And there was something about that, the something about that opportunity that, you know, really brought me to um, the California endowment. I never thought I would be in philanthropy. I thought I was going to stay in medicine. And here I am 12 years later. Well, yeah, I was just going to say, we're so glad you made the, the journey and the transition to philanthropy. 
So I, I think you already spoke to a couple of the themes and uh, that will come out of this conversation. And I think that it's one reason I wanted you to share a, a little bit about um, your path into philanthropy. So for folks that may not know, they, they may have heard of the California Endowment. They may know that it's a, a health conversion or a health legacy foundation, but could you share a little bit about BHC? What are some of the, the big goals? What did it set out to do? And what are some of the kind of key components of of the Building Healthy Communities Initiative. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Anand. So the genesis of Building Healthy Communities, um, what we call, you know, this 10-year place-based community change initiative taking place in 14 communities all across California from as far north as, you know, the Oregon border um, to as far south as uh, San Diego and all in between the Central Valley. And the idea behind it was, what if instead of focusing our investments primarily on services, on addressing the symptoms, what if, what if we instead focused on um, investing on the root causes of health and life inequities? And by doing so, um, a really engaging and creating pathways of opportunities for those who were directly impacted by those health and life inequities, who we believed at the time were actually the experts in designing solutions in partnerships with systems. That was the original, you know, sort of spirit and vision. Um, that theme, um, you know, around centering those most impacted to really support the design of solutions has been the through line of the work. And we have continued to really expand on that, um, that spirit, that notion and that belief into what we're moving in in our next 10 year plan. And Lauren, I know we'll get into this a little bit more as the conversation progresses, but I, um, for folks that may not be familiar with some of the particular investments and work that took place. Could you give folks a flavor of some of the types of things that TCE invested in and, and engaged in um, as part of the kind of core strategies of BHC? Sure. So uh, when I said, you know, sort of moving the idea of moving investments away from solely um, services to really, which really, when you look at um, we looked at the endowments sort of first 10 years of its investments, which were really more focused on responsive grant making, um, discrete um, responses to need. You know, when you evaluate or ask the question, um, you know, millions of dollars of investments, the question became how much have we moved the needle on achieving equity in California? And the sobering answer to that is, We've made some really good grants, but those changes have not been lasting. And so the idea of building healthy communities, let's invest, let's take a different approach. Let's try something different. And let's move more to root cause uh, and engage community, um, not just residents, but other stakeholders to help rethink what health can look like in a community, primarily as defined by those who, my, who are most um, closest to the pain of health inequities, and then build supports that foster deeper collaboration and that support the organizing of those who are most impacted. So that is that I think that initial when we first, you know, the thinking behind BHC was engaging those who were most impacted community, and the evolution has been around really supporting um, organized power of residents to really make demands of systems to shift practices and policies and investments that lead toward more equitable outcomes for all people in their communities and their regions. The investments could be on any targeted system, justice, re justice reform, justice reinvestment, healthcare access, land use, housing, anti-displacement, the issue is irrelevant. It's really what does the community want to focus on in their regions, in their ecosystems that will get to the, the equitable changes 
their families and community, the families and communities want to see. Lauren, I think that's very helpful in kind of setting out um, how TCE got to where it is. And the other thing that I think might be helpful for folks to know when you started touching upon this is the importance of taking a very broad definition of what um, health equity entails. And I, just before we bring in our, our next guest, I wanted to give you space, Lauren, to talk about how you and uh, TCE uh, see the relationship between health equity and, and racial equity. Sure, Anand, do you want me to answer that right now? Yeah, go for it. Okay, okay. So um, it, it's very comfortable and easy to talk about health. We all wanna see healthy families. We all wanna see healthy communities. We all wanna see systems that are responsive to the needs of community. Uh, um, and what's really hard to do is to, uh, and, and we use terminology like social determinants of health. Um, we use terminology like a public health approach to addressing violence. But we're, what we're, uh, what's really hard to do is to name what is at the root of that. And what is at the root of that in this country is structural racism. And as someone who worked in the healthcare system for 10 years before coming to the endowment, I can say that this absence of naming what is at the root cause of health inequities it's, is what has prevented us from addressing the robust solutions to get to addressing structural racism because it exists, it's in the water we breathe, it's in the water we swim in and the air we breathe, but we don't talk about it because we're afraid to lean into it because it's uncomfortable. For us at the California Endowment, achieving health equity means we have to address structural racism and white supremacy culture. In order to do that, we can't just expect our communities to do that, we have to do it. We have to look at the mirror and understand how we have adopted, uh, how we live and breathe in these racist cultures and we have to build the emotional fortitude, not just the policy change to lean in and really break free and ultimately, find our full humanity um, and, and work to achieve um, those equitable outcomes that we all want to see realized in America. And so racial justice, health, health equity, health justice cannot happen without racial justice and healing. The two are inextricably linked. Thank you so much, Lauren, for setting the, the table for the conversation so nicely. Uh, I want to bring in our next guest. We are very excited to have Jennifer Ito, who's research director at the University of Southern California Equity Research Institute. Uh, Jennifer, welcome to the Leap Lab. Hi, thank you. And yeah, it's, it's just great to be in the space um, and to be in conversation with Tia and Lauren. You know, even though I actually don't work very closely with with either of them, BHC has had such an impact on California <laughs> that we just feel so connected and that even just leading up to today's session, it's just been such rich dialogue. So I think we're just gonna like get the little tip of the iceberg to today, um, but really just excited for the conversation. Well, we, we know you're feeling it in California. We hope folks around the country, wherever they're tuning in are feeling that impact and feeling welcome into the, the learning and, and the work uh, of uh, health equity and, and more broadly racial equity and, and racial justice. So Jennifer, we're, we're so happy to have you. I wanted to start with a similar question to you. Um, how did you find your way into uh, the world of BHC? I know you, you were talking to you as someone that has been an evaluator and we'll get to that in just a, a moment, um, but would love for you to share just what are some of the different roles you've played and how did you find your way to the work of building healthy communities? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, just you know, being so inspired by, by Lauren's story, I'll just share a little quick um, note about my background. You know, I'm three and a half generation Japanese American, um, you know, from, from Sacramento, from the Central Valley, from a family of farmers that came over from Japan 
um, and were migrant, you know, followed the crops up and down the, the state of California. Um, you know, my grandmother was born here. And when World War II broke out, they were forced to take from one day to the next, forced to leave or displaced from their homes and take in, in my mother's family's case, to Tule Lake and my father's case to Jerome, Arkansas. And so growing up, you know, as a, as a child and, you know, with growing up um, with my parents' work, so often at my grandmother's house for dinner, like every conversation was about before the war and after the war. And, and through that, um, you know, my family learned and my parents in particular learned that the one thing that no one can ever take away from you is education and knowledge. You can have from one day to the next, you can have all of your material things taken away, but that is one thing that no one can ever take away. And so they expressed that in me by sending me to the best schools, by sending me to private schools. And they didn't ask for anything in return, except that I do the same for my children. So I had that opportunity and it is actually, um, you know, like in some of these elite institutions. And then actually it was funny, I spent some time in Guatemala as well and realized, wow, like um, these, if that's, you know, people are just inculcated with this notion of the elite that you are the leaders, you guys are the smartest folks. And there were a lot of messed up people <laughs> and realized like, I, you know, it was in Guatemala and because I had come from the U.S., was just assumed I had sort of expertise. I was straight out of undergrad um, with no clue and realized, you know, just opened my eyes a lot around just, um, you know, US imperialism and destruction of the, of the force and the indigenous ways of being that I realized I needed to come back to the US and actually I need to come back to the belly of the beast and actually fight for change um, inside the US. And so I, you know, that led me to actually do research um, and provide data and analysis that I do to this day to power social change among those, those people that don't have access to the best edu formal education. And I really wanted to dedicate my, my work to actually bringing, building up, bringing up the, the, the knowledge and the education for folks to actually participate and political processes, like small p political processes. And so, you know, I did that initially through for almost 10 years, for nine years in South Los Angeles, um, did research just at a time when philanthropy, the four foundations of national organizations were like, hey, there's something happening here and actually invested in several cities and invested specifically in community organizing. And that allowed that time, it was scoped to actually expand and bring on more um, researchers and more folks internally in-house. And so I was able to get in on the ground floor of actually providing data and research to inform organizing alliance building and campaigns. And so it was actually, you know, towards my end of the time there when BHC was launching. So it was a 10 year initiative from 2010, but there was actually like, a, like an 18 month process, a pre-planning process um, where they were gathering insights and, and coming to the community, trying to figure out where exactly is the footprint in South LA? Is it this road? Is it that neighborhood? <laughs> and being asked to attend all these meetings um, and with this idea of the endowment coming with a very cooked plan, <laughs> um, learning from past comprehensive change agendas when and goals can be fuzzy, they kind of were like, okay, here's our goals. Here's our four goals. Here are our 10 outcomes. Here are five drivers of change. And, you know, we're going to give you money, you know, which was great that they allowed for a planning process. It was great that they issued some small grants to be part of this, but they wanted us at the table with the police department, with the public health department, with the head of education. And as Lauren said, there's always been a very big emphasis on community engagement from the beginning. So even in the planning process, there was a very strong emphasis that, okay, we, you guys need to come up with your logic model for three years about how you're going to achieve these outcomes. You don't have to work on all of them in the first three years, but we do want you to hit all 10 of them by the end of 10 years. Um, and so there was just a lot of, um, friction. <laughs> you know, even though we're all in South LA, we don't come with the same day. We don't come. There was a lot of distrust. 
and particularly around resident engagement, because of course there were funds, and of course this was a time of 2008 recession, right? Groups are struggling. Here's some big pot of money. Here's a promise of some big funds coming down for 10 years. Everybody wants to be at the table. And so there was, there was funding to actually engage residents, and there was big friction between service providers saying, yeah, we have a huge clientele, and organizers were like, hey, wait a minute, we're like the organizers, we know how to do this. And so that was kind of just from the beginning, this emphasis on community engagement, and that we've seen kind of over time, actually, you know, there was very, lots of different words used. It was from community engagement, then it was like, okay, it was resident engagement, then it was resident-led organizing, and then it was community organizing, <laughs> and then um, it's become kind of this notion of power building. And I do want to unpack that a bit because I think there is still a lot of confusion about now that word of uh, being equated with civic engagement and all that. So, but we'll get there later. Um, but so we're just as part of um, you know when I switched over to do research full time uh, through um, the at USC now called the Equity Research Institute, we actually were brought on to actually help tell the story and figure out what was going on as in the first three years of from 2010 um, to 2013, just to catch some early lessons. So that's, yeah, that's just a quick, <laughs> how I came to this work. No, it, you did a beautiful job of weaving in kind of how you came to the work as well as um, some of the early days of BHC. And I think it's really important because even though this is a, a hard task to boil down 10 years of work in many communities across the entire state into a, you know, a short conversation, I do think it is important for folks to know that even though there are some clear lessons and insights we hope others will learn, it's a messy process, it takes time, and it is not a straight shot um, you know, down the road from, from year one to year uh, 10. So I think you did very helpful framing. And, and Jennifer, I'll let you know, it is later. It is now time to unpack power building. So you said we'd get to it later. We're going to do that right now. So I think that is a term that is thrown around, organizing, power building. People use it more frequently now and are more interested in it. How would you uh, define power building? How do you think about power building and, and how is it different than some of the other types of ways that community members can be involved that you were talking about? Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, I think there's a whole spectrum and it's actually out of the work of Selena's, there's a really great spectrum, a really great resource and we can share this afterwards about thinking about that spectrum of engagement from like being ignored to getting input all the way to ownership. Um, and so I see power building in a couple different ways. I think one is that because of all the reasons that Lauren, that Lauren talked about, you need to start with the folks that are most impacted that are either implicitly or explicitly um, not able to participate in public and private decision-making processes that affect their lives and their communities. So whether that's because they can't, because they can't vote because of whatever reason, or if it's because they can't, they don't have, um, they can't attend public hearings because they're in the middle of the day or in a different language. So I, so community organizing is an essential vehicle um, to actually engaging those folks who just won't turn out if there's just a flyer stack or by a message or by a text. I mean, there are, community organizing is essential um, to, and because powerlessness is at the very, very root is one of the key structural determinants of health and outcomes. Like we have to build power um, and knowledge and, and organization um, to keep our, our communities healthy. So I think community organizing is central and any organizer will tell you a resident wants to fight for what change is needed. They don't wanna fight for what change is politically feasible. And that's where it's, that's how we'll actually get to change conditions is if people are telling us our lives are not improving. Um, so that's essential. And yet it's not sufficient to, to change the conditions. In South LA, we always said, you know, we, we can't change even if we organized every single resident in South LA and that was like 250,000 people, we still wouldn't be able to get to the change needed because that just represents one city council district. Like we need a majority of city council. We need to, the state to hear us. We need businesses to hear us. And so, 
So that requires a whole nother set of skills, capacities, strategies, um, in which you need the research, you need the leadership development, um, you need the communication skills, the policy knowledge and, and advocacy, and, and you need strong organizations. And you need what we're learning. And I think, you know, what we've really learned, and, and Lauren spoke to this, is that we're also realizing that there's a lot of harm and trauma um, in our communities that gets carried across generations that gets really internalized. And part of this work of power building is to create a different society based on a different set of values, on a different model of, of how we work with others. And if you don't address kind of the deep traumas at the very individual level, they will replicate those same harmful patterns in the work of organizing. Um, and so we've seen a lot of um, amazing transformational work that's needed for folks just to realize their own triggers and actually model and see and be part of processes in which they can model a new way in which we can work with communities to build consensus, to actually understand why are we living in, this, in these conditions and what are the ways that we can actually change this. Um, that also kind of that, in, that work of really addressing trauma and healing, um, I think is becoming much more recognized as an essential part of the strategy as well. Jennifer, I wanted to give you space just briefly to say a little bit more about something that I think you're alluding to, which is this idea that there are lots of different organizations, lots of different capacities that are involved in, in power building. And how have you and your colleagues uh, come to start understanding that landscape and all the different folks uh, involved in any particular region, community, when you're thinking about power building? Mm -hmm. I mean, we've come to think of this, we actually came out of this work from a movement building lens. Um, you know, but, move, but we've actually realized kind of where we're really at um, when we're thinking about particularly where foundations are funding and, and in that realm, that it's really kind of an ecosystem of organizations. Um, and so, you know, we have this great little power flower <laughs> as like a visual, but the main purpose was just to put organizing and base building at the center and kind of the pedals, those supportive roles are you know, all the other capacities and like I put foundations in the panel, policy advocacy, organizational technical assistance, research, policy advocacy. And they are on the pedal if they ascribe to the same values and have the same kind of analysis and approach of realizing at the end of the day, whatever we do, it needs to be growing that center. This all needs to be accountable back to the community. So there are policy advocacy groups, there are government support groups that, that are in this world, but that we would not necessarily ascribe as being part of the ecosystem because they just have a different approach in which it's more about the policy, um, but we see those as, as being important, but also leading to shallower wins because when you have um, a community that's educated, that's ready, that, that knows what's going on and is in direct relationship with decision makers, they are able to keep kind of the policy, the implementation and making sure that that win actually translates into improved conditions that they can see every day. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I think it's really helpful context to unpack, you know, the idea of power building in this context and providing that kind of uh, framework for, for thinking about uh, all the different uh, folks and organizations and alliances and uh, groups that are involved uh, in any particular uh, region uh, who's doing this work. I wanted to bring in our third and our uh, final guest for today. Very excited to be joined by Tia Martinez, who is the CEO of Forward Change. Tia has lots of experience, a little bit of research, a little bit of policy. She's been in government. She's been in philanthropy. She's been, you know, creating good trouble uh, all over the place. So we are so excited. Hard to name the role, uh, but not hard at all to uh, welcome her to this conversation. Tia, how are you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me. So I wanted to just bring you in to add another uh, layer, another piece of the puzzle to this conversation. And I think there's so much that you can speak to. You've been evaluating and strategizing uh, as part of the Building Healthy Communities work and many other you know, efforts uh, um, to advance racial justice, racial equity, uh, but really wanted to get your take, Tia, about 
kind of how funders typically approach these types of policy and advocacy campaigns and, and how is BHC different? And I think it's not a hard sell for folks nowadays to say, we've got to go beyond programs and services, uh, but there's a difference between policy and, and, and power building, and those aren't necessarily the, the same thing. So we'd love to hear your reflections uh, on kind of how funders typically approach this and how did this uh, approach uh, evolve uh, over the course of building healthy communities? Great, thank you. Um, so I think the one way to think about it is just to kind of leap off Jennifer's power flower. Okay, so this idea of a power ecosystem. And in this case, we've centered grassroots space building groups, but there's the legal shops, the policy shops, the research, all of those folks, all of the kind of uh, usual players, they're all around there attached to and aligned with the center and that we need all of them to make this shift. Now, this is what happens in the usual course of things is that, that funders recognize the limitations of services, and programmatic innovation as the only way to do it. They realized that, that they could put their money in policy shifts and they could get government money to things and government rule change and get there really faster. So they see, they see power as equaling policy and advocacy, right? And they see, um, they, they, they see power as instrumental to their, so they wanna end, you wanna end childhood obesity. Okay, I need a, a soda sales tax. And I'm going to find the best professional advocacy shop to do this work. And they're going to kick butt and get this, this passed. So it's very instrumental. And it's, it's centering one of those pedals. OK, that's who's at the center of this. Right now, what you do get, you know, foundations are impatient. Like foundations are just, we know that, right? Everybody wants, you know, they want population level change in three years, you know? And, you know, here's $1 million that I want you to, to increase double, you know, graduation rates and self-rated self health, right? So there's an impatience here that those professional advocates can deliver on, okay? So what what, what I'm saying is if you would say, if, if, if the foundation is holding the strategy and they're like, oh, I really need the soda sales tax, they can go find the really sharp, you know, policy shop to do that work, right? And they get the win in two years, okay? And they get to celebrate it, they get to tell their board, look at, we got this win, what amazing return, all this money, blah, 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 okay? But what are the limits of that win? Okay, the first, and Jennifer spoke about it. The first thing is, you know, you really want that win to play out in communities of color and in poor communities in real ways. There's gonna be no monitoring or implementation on the ground to ensure that these rule changes actually translate into something different. We all know about kind of regulatory capture, right? You can make shifts and change things and somehow the usual players still make it work for them. <laughs> right, without having a constituency pushing, okay? So the issue is the professional advocates, when the foundations come along with the next, next big thing they want you to do, they're gonna fly over oh, children's healthcare or, you know, they're, they're gonna fly away from this. They're not gonna stick with it because, you know, they, they think it's important on their agenda, but they actually, you know, they don't have a deep personal investment in it the way folks who are living that do so so it's 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 not I'm not dumping on on folks I am one of them first of all I will own my my pedal my pedal residency I am you know a professional advocate right you know and and we have a broader agenda and we like yes so to tax we also need this and that and that right so there's not um both there's not support for implementation but there is also not a sustainable strategy because you haven't created a base. The, the example I always use is why do middle class people have great schools? Why do middle and up, I should say middle and upper class people have great public schools, right? They have great public schools because they have motivated, resourced families that show up and hold folks accountable and demand, 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 right? And are listened to, right? So that when we have these top-down policy expert changes, you are building that constituency among our folks that we need. And by the way, we're gonna need kind of twice the power because we're gonna be facing structural racism, explicit racism when we try to talk to that school board, right? So, so I think that's the, the kind of usual way, right? So now we wanna talk about how that could look different and how, how BHC did it different, right? 
BHC was uh, one of the amazing things about TCE is its learning loops. It could drive, I've been a consultant forever and it, it can drive us crazy because they're always changing their outcomes and their approach and there's a new framework and I'm like, Jesus, just stick with one thing, right? But they, what they're doing is learning. What they're doing is making mistakes, listening to everyone get really upset and then making changes. And then people are still upset and they make more changes. So this, this is, so BHC did not come into this knowing this, but where they arrived after this pivot to power that Jennifer was talking about, where they arrived is, hey, you know what? Instead of centering the pedals and getting those, let's go to the center, okay? Let's begin to support those base building groups that create, build power in a sustainable way in communities close to the ground. And they can work with those pedals. They need those pedals, but we're gonna center these groups. Now, easier said than done, because you just have to recognize that the environment we're in, the, the, his, the historical period we're in is, you know, nearly 50 years of massive disinvestment from voluntary membership groups that organize folks on the ground, okay? So that means if you're gonna invest in grassroots, you, you need to, first of all, put in the money, right? And then you need to be patient, okay? Because the hard work of rebuilding that infrastructure, but also the hard work of base building, of involving folks, in, uh, uh, members of the community in this, of building their leadership skills, of building their ability to speak, and of hassling with all the pedal partners like myself, who like, you know, you have to negotiate. Listen, remember, we're, we should be leading this, not you, right? So that's a lot of work. And so really, it, 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 this is patient capital. OK, you're not going to get your three year win. You could you could shortcut it and you could get your win much faster. But if you want the longer, sustainable, powerful one, then you, you, you're you willing to, to fund that center. Now, just one last thing. And then I know you've taken up too much time to tell by your eyes. Um, um, so but the last thing is, is the kind of the, the historical background, which this functions against is, you know, Theta Scotch Poll writes about um, the decline of voluntary uh, uh, membership organizations in, in the United States uh, from the mid 60s to the 70s, right? So it used to be the way that ordinary people kind of exercised power was through big membership organizations that had local affiliates. They were like unions, the Lions Club, there was uh, 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 churches and, and their networks. Not only did they have people, actually members doing things like being the secretary, being the chair, figuring out the visits, they had their members actually doing things and they were connected in regional and national networks that allowed them to exercise power. It, it, with the 60s came a pivot, the 60s and the 70s, we moved away from membership to professional advocacy. OK, so instead of now we have membership groups, the membership group is going to be like the ACLU, right, or the environmental defense, like the, it's membership in name only. You get an email letter, you give money, right? You, that's how you do it. But you're not actively doing this. You're not you're not involved. So it's, it's a different type. And what you do is you cede your power instead of ordinary people figuring this out. You cede it to professionals like myself. And so I benefited greatly from this shift because everyone wants lawyers. Right. So you get so now remember, foundations have been behind this building up of this. So who's been centered over the last 50 years increasingly are the, the pedals. Right. So that the, 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 at, at the other side, membership groups have been hollowed out by Quintelpro, by Backlash. So every all of the membership groups we have have either withered and died or um, they've been hollowed out through counterinsurgency. Right. So. Now, what that means is now where we are is we're in rebuild, okay? And so what my urgent plea to everyone is if you want to affect health, right, in real ways, address race and power and be willing to invest over the long term. Now I'm done. No apologies necessary to you. I apologize we don't have more time uh, for uh, everyone to, to share, but I think just again, another brilliant perspective uh, to add to, to Jennifer and Lawrence. I want to stay on this theme that you uh, ended on, Tia, which is looking to the future. There's a lot more work to be done. And as you think about philanthropy, uh, we'd love to hear from you, Tia, and then bring uh, Lauren and Jennifer in uh, before we uh, close out the panel on this question of what will it take? What will it take to be more serious about uh, building power, sharing power uh, with communities, and truly advancing equity 
uh, and racial justice. So we'd love to hear, Tia, any kind of thoughts you have, because I know we've had a conversation before about the level of investment that currently exists and would love for you to kind of carry that thought. What will it take to truly build and share power and um, have philanthropy make more meaningful progress toward racial justice? Yeah, I mean, and, and, and I'm gonna put it kind of in a health justice frame since a lot of folks here. One thing that's really exciting is the number of conversion foundations in the cell that are here, okay? This is a huge opportunity. You know how little of the philanthropic pie the self gets anyway, okay? Um, but what I wanna talk about is the kind of two things that are needed. First, a real understanding of what power is, what Jennifer talked about, and getting away from this idea of resident engagement, right? Of, it's about people coming to meetings or we're holding focus groups or you know, get beyond that, even get beyond, okay, now we believe that you, know, you should have folks that organize community members and have them give informed input and can actually, get beyond that to where you're really supporting organizations to lo do long-term leadership building and you're letting those organizations um, set the agenda as opposed to setting the agenda for them, creating the table. So that's the first thing is to understand that loop and understand the power ecosystem. The second thing is just money, okay? So the, 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 this is a, a, an analysis of really, really great piece was released earlier this week or last week from the Philanthropic Initiative for Racial Equity looking at the surge of money that went in to, uh, uh, from philanthropy around racial justice um, in the wake of George Floyd. It takes a long view. It looks at sort of 10 years of data. And this is the, the reality, right? So about um, 2018, which is the year they have the, the, the most recent data, uh, total giving from foundations was about 92 billion, okay? So 92 billion, and of that 92 billion, about 5.8 billion went into racial equity. And the bulk of this was going to things like charter schools and after school programs, right? So this wasn't a racial, so first of all, remember that. So what, what they did is they said, okay, well, let's look at how much of that is going to racial equity or racial justice and grassroots. So an annual number. What they found is that in 2018, just 75 million, that's it. Out of that 95 billion, just 75 million went into grassroots organizing for racial equity, okay? TC probably accounted for at least half of that, right? Before this pivot, right? You know, exactly. And so this is, this is profound. Like any, TC, as TCE increases the amount that they give to base building, these numbers are gonna jump in big ways. But for any of you all, any increase in support of this is going to be incredibly meaningful because you're beginning at such low levels. But if we seriously want to rebuild that infrastructure and get enough power to challenge who we're up against, then it's going to take concerted, deeper investment over time. And it's going to take way more than TC. Thank you, Tia. I want to get others in the conversation. So Lauren, please. Oh, thanks, Ellen. And I was going to say one more thing to Tia's point. I'm glad she brought up uh, the report, which I included in the chat. What of the 7% total, 1% went to racial equity efforts, and then 6% went to racial justice efforts. The two are very distinct. Racial equity is the idea of moving monies around in existing systems to increase services or, you know, to increase access to services in an existing system. Racial justice is about transformation, which requires organized power rooted in a racial equity, racial justice analysis led by those most impacted. That's about transforming systems. And so that's 1%. That's the 1% that Tia is talking about. So in many ways, we feel like we've done a lot. It feels like, wow, we've come so far. We haven't, we have not, we should not feel like this is, you know, we, sh we should be glad that we've, we're moving the needle, but it is so woefully inadequate given how much money there is out there that could be going to these kinds of deeper structural investments. Really appreciate that, Lauren, and, and being very clear about the distinction between racial equity and racial justice. Jennifer, would love to get you in on the conversation, just reflecting on Tia and Lauren's comments and this overall question of, you know, what will it take uh, on the part of philanthropy to, to make more progress toward uh, racial equity and, as Lauren put it, uh, racial justice? I just want to build on this notion of, um, you know, being 
in a learning community about what it takes, um, you know, for social change. And one of the ways that I think one thing is just realizing not one size fits all and that to really understand um, and to be in conversation with others that are kind of have the same vision and long-term horizon to really understand the context in which the work happens. So, you know, whether it's a, you're, you're considering a certain particular place, it's understanding that context matters. So that's taking into account the socioeconomic conditions, the demographics, the politics, the geography, the history um, of a place really shapes the nature of this work, as does the capacities for change. So what does that ecosystem look like? What, you know, how robust is it? How broad, how, how, re- how what's their reach? How connected are they? What's kind of the, the breadth and, and depth of leadership in that whole ecosystem? And to tie it back to the points that, that Lauren and Tia raised, like what is the resource base? And so I think that's particularly understanding, you know, we have lots to learn about how, how community organizing and movement building works. We'd love to see kind of philanthropy build its, build its own, um, you know, groups like TCE and others to really work together in alliances to think about what are the strategies to grow that resource base. Um, to put back, to invest back into com- community organizing and power building. So before we close out, I want to give uh, each of our uh, panelists a chance to just share a parting thought uh, that they would give to folks who are, are viewing. Uh, and um, we'll start in reverse order. And I would love, Tia, just any closing thought or advice you'd give to folks who, again, we're just scratching the iceberg here of these topics and the learnings from, from BHC, but would love uh, to hear um, kind of your final thought or, or reflection on the conversation, Tia. You know, besides like we need more money to the center of the flower, right? Um, I think um, that if you want to, in a big sustainable way, change health co- outcomes, you must confront race and you must center the folks who are experienced this and you must build their power. So that's the equation. Like, and I could tell a million examples about how we went from technical approaches that really had little impact, like in the justice, criminal justice field, to once you brought those technical approaches together with the community and community power. And by the way, the community will insist that you bring up race, even if it doesn't pull well, you then begin to see transformative shifts. And actually, if you wait long enough, you see massive change in population level indicators. That's my. Thanks, Thea. Uh, Jennifer, closing thought? You know, I think to, you know, expand beyond policy, as you're saying, like to really think about the full terrain in which, which change needs to happen um, and all the full arenas, that it's policy change, but it's also administrative change, it's shifting narrative, it's shifting our culture, um, it's shifting kind of the way corporations and businesses work. So I think it's just understanding the full terrain and in that sense, um, you, you open up the field and create more opportunities for real strategic conversations about what each of our roles is in moving towards health and justice for all. Thank you. And Lauren, we'll give you the last word. Okay. So uh, I, I'm just think I'm wondering how this is all landing on you, like how you're feeling about this, like, I can imagine it's swirling in your bodies, in your mind about like how you're gonna bring this back. And I guess to to your colleagues and to the organization and what I would first say to you all is uh, that's a good thing. And uh, just to remember that um, to, to, to to, to want, you know, if we wanna see transformation in our, in the systems, in communities, um, we have to be ready and willing to do our own transformation internally. So if the urge is to wanna go and do the fund right now, resist that urge and do some some work on interrogating your own cultures um, that will allow you to set the groundwork for doing your own transformation. That would be my first word of advice. And that is not only 
something that requires thinking, which is what white dominant culture tells us we have to do. It's about the feeling. It's about the embodied practice you need because this is not easy work. This is hard work. You're going to have board members pushing back on you. You're going to have people def deflecting, resisting, denying, getting defensive. And so you have to get yourself prepared and others prepared in a way that allows you to do that deeper level of interrogation. And that's what our communities want us to do. Look in the mirror. We need to look in the mirror and be the change we want to see on the external.